Now we've been reporting for some time now that global shipping is severely disrupted. The Panama Canal, a crucial trade artery, has recently become a crowded parking lot for cargo ships. Hundreds of vessels are waiting their turn on this 80-kilometer stretch connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Annually, about 14,000 ships rely on this vital channel, managing 6% of global traffic. However, the canal now faces technical challenges, space limitations, and climate change-related issues that threaten its key role in global trade. This significant disruption and its consequences need to be explored. But first, it's important to understand the canal's origins. Previously, sailing from the Atlantic to the Pacific was a dangerous journey, requiring sailors to navigate the treacherous Drake Passage and Strait of Magellan at the southern tip of South America, facing deadly currents and strong winds. Recognizing the need for a safer, faster route, Spanish explorers envisioned the Panama Canal, a project that would cut across the narrow land separating North and South America, allowing ships to travel between the Atlantic and Pacific in much less time, saving days or even weeks. The idea of a canal emerged when Spanish explorers saw the potential for easier ocean crossings. Although other locations were considered, Panama was ultimately chosen, especially after the U.S. built a railroad there in the 1800s. A railway was built along almost the same route as the proposed canal. However, constructing the canal proved to be a daunting challenge. The first attempt to build a canal across Panama's narrow land bridge started in 1881, when Panama was still part of Colombia. The French company, La Compagnie Universelle du Canal Interoceanique, which had successfully built the Suez Canal in Egypt, was assigned the task. Ferdinand de Lesseps, the company's CEO, was confident in quickly completing the project, drawing inspiration from his past successes. He planned a sea-level canal in Panama to connect the oceans. De Lesseps raised substantial funds, convincing many, mainly ordinary people, to invest in the project. However, not everyone agreed with his plan. After surveying Panama's geography, Another skilled engineer, Adolphe Godin de Lepinay, believed the sea-level canal wouldn't work. He proposed a different strategy, creating large artificial lakes by damming the Chagres River, which flows into the Atlantic, and the Rio Grande, which flows into the Pacific. These dams at Gatun and Miraflores would create lakes about 25 meters deep. Lepinay proposed a plan to carve a channel through the mountains and use locks to move ships between different water levels eventually connecting them to the ocean. Although experts praised his idea, the French construction industry rejected it in favor of the original plan, which led to failure. De Lesseps underestimated Panama's challenges, wrongly comparing it to Egypt. The harsh conditions of Panama's hot, humid, disease-ridden rainforests, along with rugged terrain and intense rainfall, were vastly different from the Suez Canal's desert environment. French machinery, designed for desert use, struggled in Panama, contributing to the project's downfall. Workers and engineers also faced severe tropical diseases, causing many deaths. In a bid to save money, the French switched from a sea-level canal to a lock-based design, but this didn't solve the problems. With no signs of profitability, the French public lost faith in the canal and its leader. After multiple failures, the company went bankrupt in 1889. Efforts to revive it in 1894 failed, and operations ended in 1898, marking the end of the French attempt to build the Panama Canal. But this wasn't the end. While the French attempt failed, a new nation took over, surprisingly not relying much on French groundwork. In 1902, the U.S. Congress passed the Spooner Act, allowing the U.S. to buy the French company's assets and canal rights. However, the U.S. still needed Colombia's approval as Colombia controlled Panama. Negotiations stalled, and in 1903, Panama declared independence from Colombia with U.S. support. This led to the Habinavarilla Treaty, giving the U.S. the right to build and manage the Panama Canal Zone. The U.S. then began the massive task of building the canal, learning from French mistakes, and using a lock-based design to navigate the terrain. The project was a huge engineering feat, with American workers overcoming severe challenges including disease and harsh conditions, by focusing on improving sanitation and combating tropical diseases. 
These measures significantly reduced deaths and improved overall workforce health. A key engineering achievement was the construction of the Gatun Locks, which raised ships 85 feet to Gatun Lake, an artificial lake formed by damming the Shagers River. Ships then crossed the lake and descended through the Pedro Miguel and Miraflores Locks to reach the Pacific Ocean. Building these locks required innovative techniques, including large concrete chambers and complex mechanical systems. The Panama Canal officially opened on August 15, 1914, revolutionizing global maritime trade by drastically reducing transit time between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Its strategic importance was highlighted during World War II, serving as a vital route for military and supply ships. Panama declared independence from Colombia in November 1903, supported by the U.S., posing a significant threat to Colombia. Rapid negotiations led to the signing of the Habianavarilla Treaty in February 1904, establishing the Panama Canal Zone and granting the U.S. control over the canal. To save costs and address different sea levels, the U.S. chose a lock-based canal, learning from the French experience and beginning construction in 1904. The process was challenging, especially with the Shagers River, whose varying water levels posed a flood risk. In 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt supported Chief Engineer John Frank Stevens' proposal for a lock-based canal, which included creating Gatun Lake, the largest artificial lake at that time, by building a massive dam at Gatun to control the Shagers River. This lake was a key part of the 50-mile canal route, helping manage the river's flow. At its peak, the project employed over 40,000 workers, making it a major effort. While engineers, administrators, and skilled laborers were mostly American, most of the laborers came from the West Indies. Over 100 steam shovels were used to dig the Calabra Cut, later renamed Gallard Cut after American engineer David Dubose Gallard, who led the work until his death. Railroads were essential for moving supplies and equipment. The unstable rock and soil in the Calabra Cut caused frequent mudslides and landslides, leading to fatalities. Controlling these earth movements was difficult, and the excavation bottom would sometimes rise suddenly. One significant event was the ongoing Cucaracha landslide in 1907, which delayed excavation by dumping millions of cubic yards of dirt. Despite these challenges, laborers persisted, often working in 38-degree heat to remove 73 million cubic meters of rock and soil using steam shovels, dynamite, and rock drills. Their determination eventually lowered the excavation floor to within 40 feet of sea level. On August 15, 1914, the Panama Canal opened for traffic despite many obstacles and the loss of many lives. To understand the Panama Canal's importance and challenges, it's crucial to know how it works. Instead of a standard design, the canal uses locks to manage varying altitudes. As a ship enters, it encounters three locks separated by gates. Water is moved from the second lock to the first, raising the ship. Once the first lock's water level matches the second, the gate opens and the ship moves into the second lock. After passing through the third lock, the ship is raised 26 meters above sea level and sails across the High Gatun Lake. To return to sea level, the ship must pass through the locks in reverse. This system relies heavily on freshwater from Gatun Lake and Lake Alahuela, with Gatun Lake being the main source. While rainfall usually replenishes this water, extreme droughts can lower water levels and threaten canal operations, highlighting its dependence on regular rain. A disruption in the water supply could threaten the Panama Canal's operation. As one of history's greatest engineering achievements, the canal profoundly impacts global trade and is crucial to international commerce. In 1970, it facilitated over 15,000 cargo transits, and this number has significantly grown. Canal traffic reflects the world economy's health. High traffic signals economic prosperity, while low traffic indicates recession. For example, during a severe financial crisis, transits fell to just 86. The Panama Canal is essential for global trade and serves as an economic indicator. It connects the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, allowing efficient transportation between continents. Its ability to handle large ships and maintain consistent traffic makes it a key part of international shipping. 
Most canal traffic is between East Asia and the U.S. East Coast, carrying goods like coal, wheat, oil, and cars. The canal also links the East Coast to Asia and the West Coast to Europe and is strategically important for the U.S. Navy for rapid naval deployment. Its ownership history is also significant. The United States controlled the canal from its completion in 1914 until 1979, when the Carter administration decided to return it to Panama. During this period, the canal was crucial, particularly in wartime, like during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis and the Vietnam and Korean Wars. The transfer of control started with the 1979 agreement and was completed by January 1st, 2000, when Panama fully took over. Despite the change in ownership, the canal remains vital to international trade, boosting regional economic growth and prompting infrastructure and technological upgrades. Its 2016 expansion, including a new set of locks, demonstrates its continued importance in a rapidly evolving trade environment. The canal's cargo capacity was expanded to accommodate larger vessels, including new Panamax ships. This has notable environmental and societal effects. Since the canal relies on fresh water from reservoirs like Lake Gatun and Lake Alahuela, water management is crucial. Extreme droughts can lower water levels in these reservoirs, threatening the canal's operation and global trade. Interruptions in water supply could significantly impact its functionality. Various solutions, such as rerouting rivers to increase water supply, have been proposed but come with drawbacks, like potential harm to local communities and ecosystems. Changes in river flows could disrupt the lives and culture of indigenous groups and impact ecosystems. Thus, any measures to address water scarcity must balance the need for a steady water supply against potential negative social and environmental effects. Although the canal is no longer U.S.-owned, it remains strategically important for the U.S., allowing warships on the East Coast to reach the Pacific 18 days faster compared to sailing around South America, which is crucial in conflicts like those with China. For Panama, the canal is its most valuable asset, essential for both military and global commercial interests. A canal closure would result in significant financial losses for Panama. Let's discuss the canal's water crisis. Each transit of the Panama Canal requires 52 million gallons of water. This water mainly comes from Gatun Lake, which is fed by rainfall. However, most of this rainwater eventually returns to the ocean, creating a challenge in balancing the canal's needs with the needs of Panama's 4.3 million residents who depend on the same water sources for drinking. Historically, Panama, one of the wettest countries, has had plenty of rain, but 2023 saw significant declines, especially in Gatun Lake. Hope you liked the video. Subscribe for more educational content. Thanks for watching.